Hello and welcome to Course Zero Lesson 3, Cellular Networks. Today we will be discussing the types of networks you would see modelled within a cell, how these networks are represented visually, and the types of interactions you would see going on within these networks. Let's get started. Cellular networks have been classified into three main categories which we'll discuss in this lecture. And these are metabolic networks, gene regulatory networks, and protein signaling networks. We'll be focusing for the majority of this course on gene regulation and protein signaling, but of course metabolic networks have been studied extensively. All three of these types of networks can be represented in modeling as either stoichiometric networks or non-stoichiometric networks. We'll focus on stoichiometric networks, which are mechanistic in nature, and as such, they incorporate the laws of mass conservation, and they also take into account kinetic data, so you could have kinetic rate laws represented Um, so essentially these types of networks would show the conversion of one species into another, you would have some change in the mass that's available for further reactions, and you'd also have um, this reaction occurring at a specific rate. To classify a bit further, stoichiometric networks can be represented either as a set of elementary or non-elementary reactions. And what this means, uh, in the case of an elementary uh, stoichiometric network, you will have all of the reactions in the most simple forms possible, whereas non-elementary networks may hide some level of detail and include multiple reaction steps within a single aggregate reaction step. In contrast to that, non-stoichiometric networks do not take into account the laws of mass conservation or kinetic rate laws, but instead they describe some physical or functional interaction or relationship between molecular species. And these are becoming increasingly popular with the vast amounts of high throughput data that are being collected in our current stage of research. Before we get into the details about these different types of cellular networks, let's first go through the types of interactions we might see or regulations we might see and how these are represented symbolically in network diagrams. So our first um, type of interaction would be activation. This is a type of regulation that increases the activity of some, um, of some reaction. And it can be represented either with a line that has a circle at the end or with an arrowhead at the end. You then have inhibition as your second type of regulation. And inhibition will decrease the activity of a certain um, reaction in your model. And finally, we have mass movement. Um, this is what you think of generally when you're thinking of biochemical models and it's showing the reaction itself um, of some species being converted into another type of molecular species. These are the types of regulations we'll be looking at in our network diagrams. Let's get started with metabolic networks. These have been studied the longest since about the 1930s when we first discovered glycolysis. And metabolism is the sum of all of the reactions that are occurring within a cell. And the small molecules involved in these networks are called metabolites. These are being interconverted between various chemical forms throughout or within these networks. All right, so as I said, the species involved in metabolic networks are referred to as metabolites. which are small molecules. And you can think of some examples would be ATP or glucose. 
which of course are both involved in glycolysis. And then the reaction rates within these networks happen very quickly. The, these are the fastest of the three networks and they happen on the order of microseconds to seconds and the reason that they happen so quickly is because that most of the reactions within these networks are enzyme catalyzed. Additionally, because metabolic networks have these small molecules, they do diffuse quite quickly and this also leads to this overall fast rate. Now, metabolic networks can be further classified as either anabolic which result in net synthesis or catabolic which results in breakdown. So as an example, um, in glycolysis you get breakdown or catabolism of glucose. One of the byproducts of this process is ATP. And ATP as a source of energy can be used as an input into anabolic processes to get synthesis of some new chemical species. Alright, so to give you an example of what these um, reactions in metabolic networks look like, we have the third step of glycolysis depicted here. Um, at this point, glucose, which is the starting reactant of glycolysis, has been converted into fructose 6-phosphate. And it, during this reaction, an enzyme, phosphofructokinase, which is also depicted here using a space-filling model from the PDB. Um, during this reaction, phosphofructokinase activates, you see the activation symbol here, the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-diphosphate. This reaction is dependent on ATP. So here you can see that ATP is being converted into ADP, and that's because an, a phosphate group from ATP is being transferred to fructose 1,6-diphosphate. Um, just to point out something on the enzyme itself, it has two, it has um, bi binding sites for the sugar, so either fructose 6-phosphate or fructose 1,6-diphosphate, and it also has a binding site for ATP or ADP. Yes, so again, this is an example of one of the reactions in a metabolic network, and the enzyme is activating the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-diphosphate. And just as a reminder, this white arrow is showing mass transfer. So both in um, the reaction of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-diphosphate, you have mass transfer, and you also have it in the conversion of ATP to ADP. The next type of network we're going to discuss are protein signaling networks, and these can coordinate and process signals from the internal and the external environments. The key players are proteins and metabolites. And the reactions within these networks happen on the second fastest scale. They are generally seconds to minutes. The types of behaviors we'll be discussing in protein signaling networks will be covalent modifications. So these will involve the metabolites. And generally, the covalent modification will change the activity of the protein. And we'll also be discussing complex formation. Uh, which is just proteins coming together to form a complex, which may have some different activity than the protein does on its own. And you can also have things like um, proteins interacting with one another in a way that changes the overall structure of the protein so that it has some different activity. Here we're just representing complex formation. Now, 
protein complexes form through non-covalent interactions. So you can imagine they might have very favorable hydrogen bonding between some domains on the proteins. The first um, picture we have here is representing homodimerization. which is simply when two protein monomers, which are the same protein, they have the same primary structure, and a monomer is just one single protein unit, and they come together to form your complex. So again, the monomers in this case are the same protein. The next picture we have is representing heterodimerization. which is just when two different protein monomers come together to form the complex. And finally, we just have represented one final image of a complex formation, which is showing a trimer, but you can imagine that any number of protein monomers could come together to form your complex. The next type of key mechanism we might see represented in a protein signaling network would be protein modification, with, uh, which would involve covalent modification with some small molecule. So here we just have represented a phosphate being either added or removed to a protein. In this case, it's being added, which is indicating phosphorylation. And that would mean that this protein, which is um, activating the reaction, uh, would be a kinase, which is an enzyme that is able to add a phosphate group to another protein. Um, in the other case, we have dephosphorylation. where the phosphate group is being removed from the protein um, and this would mean that the protein here is a phosphatase and it is activating the reaction to remove the phosphate group from the protein. Addition of a phosphate group or phosphorylation is not the only type of protein modification we can have, of course. There are many different types of small molecule modifications. Um, another example would be ubiquitination. And ubiquitin, it, when it's added to a protein, can generally signal for the protein to be degraded by a proteasome. So going off of that, we have protein degradation as another protein mechanism that you would see in these types of networks. And here we just have a complex which is being degraded. So you can see that a dimer is breaking off of the complex and one of the proteins within that was part of the complex is being ubiquitinated. As I just mentioned, um, by these small molecules called ubiquitin and then the proteasome during this reaction here is leading to degradation so this is just showing breakdown of this protein and then here we just have a protein which has been phosphorylated being broken down after it's been after it's been converted it's been dephosphorylated ubiquitin has been covalently modified um, the protein has been covalently modified with ubiquitin again and this is able to signal it to be degraded the last type of network we're going to discuss is the gene regulatory network and in this network the key players are transcription factors And these can be proteins, largely they are proteins, or small molecules. And transcription factors regulate which genes are expressed at which time and to what extent by binding to upstream DNA sequences that are called operator sites. Now, gene regulatory networks function on the slowest time scale of the three. They generally occur over minutes to hours. And the reason for this is that transcription and translation are both time consuming processes. Um, so these happen minutes to hours. because transcription
so the production of mRNA and translation are slow. So again, translation, of course, is the production of protein from your mRNA sequence. All right, so I want to briefly touch on the concept of granularity in modeling. So granularity refers to the level of detail that you're including in your model. If you have high granularity, that means you have a very detailed model. Um, and it's important to note that at times researchers might not explicitly state the reactions that they're modeling, and so, or they might only include higher level um, reactions and they won't include all of the detail that is necessary. They won't include all of the elementary reactions. So for example, in this picture here you see an inducer binding to a gene, it's activating it. You see transcription and translation are explicitly represented. However, you might not include in the model something like RNA polymerase interacting interacting with slash polymerizing um, nucleotides so you might not uh, represent the binding of each nucleotide um, to one another to create our mRNA as separate reactions. You might not include that level of detail. Or we might not include um, during translation um, the, again, quite similarly, the polymerization of amino acids. to create your peptide, and um, which will later be converted into a protein. So some of these steps are likely missing from the model, and so you just want to be aware that the model is not including every elementary reaction. They're, they are lacking some detail. So in gene regulation, of course, we have activation and repression as before, um, just to make note of that. Again, we see our symbol representing activation here and this just tells the gene to lead to quite a bit of RNA, mRNA production or to upregulate mRNA production. In the, on the other hand, inhibition once again we see our symbol for inhibition here um, is leading to the cessation of production of some mRNA, so it is slowing down that production. And of course you can imagine that both of these are happening as the result of some transcription factor. To further specify the types of gene regulation we see, we have autoregulation, so where a gene regulates itself. Uh, of course you can imagine that this is an implicit representation because the reality is that a protein produced by this gene is inhibiting the, pr the activation of that gene. Um, another type of gene regulation we have here is a gene cascade. Which is just a series of genes regulating one another. Um, so one, the first gene regulates the second gene, which regulates the third gene. So as I mentioned, small molecules and metabolites are also able to regulate genes. So here we have two examples of that. Imagine you have a transcription factor which is able to activate a gene, and then you add in some small molecule which inhibits that transcription factor. Well, if you're inhibiting a transcription factor that activates the gene, the net result on the gene would be repression, so you're slowing down the production of some mRNA. Alternatively, we have another example here where you have a transcription factor. Once again, it activates a gene and some kinase comes in, it adds a phosphate group to your transcription factor and the result of that is to activate the, the transcription factor. So activating the transcription factor, you upregulate activation of that gene and that is able to produce more mRNA. And just as a quick reminder before we conclude this video, um, we've discussed metabolic gene regulatory
and also protein signaling networks. And while we've discussed them all as separate entities, you can imagine that these are all highly interrelated. Um, they all interact with one another to create the whole picture of the cell that we're studying. And that concludes Course Zero Lesson 3 on cellular networks. We've discussed metabolic, gene regulatory, and protein signaling networks. And we'll next be moving on to some math, some very basic math, and then we'll get into actually modeling these sorts of networks.